So I'll just introduce it uh, for everybody. Thanks for joining in. Um, we are going to be recording this session, uh, the presentation component, uploading it to Facebook afterwards uh, and Twitter, so as well as YouTube. So if you have questions, we'll cut those parts out so you can ask questions uh, free of concern about them being uploaded. Um, but uh, yeah, so we'll get it up on afterwards. So I'll hand this off to Murat. We're going to be talking about this trial that uh, him and Dr. Hegazy wanted to discuss, and uh, it's exciting to innovate as always. So Murat, I'll let you take it away. Uh, thanks very much, Paul, and thank you everybody for joining this afternoon. Um, the purpose of this um, presentation is sort of building on the um, presentations that we've had during COVID educational sessions, and this uh, project in particular is, uh, it relates to COVID-19. And uh, today we'll be presenting Save ICU trial, and you can see below the title, it's uh, Sedation with Volatile Anesthetics for Critical Ill COVID-19 Patients, uh, basically assessing the effects of ventilatory parameters and survival. Um, the, the way we're gonna do this talk is uh, we'll uh, basically first, uh, I'll talk in the first part uh, about why do we need this trial. We'll, we'll discuss a little bit of the rationale behind it and uh, just high level overview of the trial. And in the second part, uh, I'll pass the puck over to Ahmed who will uh, speak a little bit about how do we gonna deliver anesthetics uh, in the intensive care unit. Uh, so to start, I wanted to first to thank the amazing LHSC study team. These are some of the uh, people who are uh, helping us to get this off the ground. And I think the biggest thing to highlight here is that this is a truly multidisciplinary effort that reflects our current practice, uh, multidisciplinary practice in critical care. Uh, we have uh, physicians, we have nursing, pharmacy, RTs, uh, our research coordinators at both sites. I was trying to find a picture of Tim Winterburn on internet uh, on a short notice and I couldn't locate him uh, despite all my trolling skills. So given that he is uh, the most interesting man at uh, uh, University Hospital, I decided that this was an appropriate pick for him. So we will update us in, in due course. So uh, to begin, I'd like to talk about um, what problem we're actually trying to solve with uh, this trial? Why, why do this in the first place? Uh, as you know, COVID pandemic has swept the world. And uh, one of the challenges is that up to 40% of COVID-19 patients develop acute respiratory distress syndrome that requires mechanical ventilation. And as we well know, uh, anybody who has ARDS and needs a mechanical ventilator needs to be sedated. Uh, and our usual practice in the ICUs currently is to use intravenous sedatives. Um, the challenge that arose as part of the pandemic is that we uh, have seen a global shortage of intravenous sedatives. And this occurred uh, primarily due to three reasons. First of all, we're obviously facing a large number of ventilated patients. And uh, these patients required long duration of mechanical ventilation, up to uh, a median of 10 days. We also saw a disruption of global supply chains, and uh, you all have uh, witnessed uh, email communications from our pharmacy about conserving uh, various IV sedatives uh, and other medication during this pandemic. The, um, there is, uh, what we all can appreciate is that if we don't have sedatives available to us, we're not gonna be able to offer mechanical ventilation to our COVID-19 patients. And, um, and this is irrespective of how many ventilators we, we, we build or we stock. There's been a lot of um, media attention to uh, new projects trying to develop null ventilators and increase our ventilator capacity. But uh, if we don't have sedatives, we cannot ventilate patients. The other impact of uh, sedative shortage is that it disrupts other important services that we offer in hospital, including palliation and uh, operating room uh, services. So this is a real challenge that we faced uh, during this pandemic. And this is not limited to LHSC. The same uh, shortage was reported in hospitals across Europe and elsewhere around the world. So we need a way to uh, sedate our patients and develop an alternative method that is uh, readily available 
and uh, easily scalable, and not just in uh, London, Ontario, Canada, uh, but across the world. And today I wanted to uh, give you 10 reasons why inhaled uh, anesthetics may be a solution to this crisis. So the first one, uh, of course, is that we are using inhaled anesthetics in the operating room currently across the world. And if you were to offer uh, 300, over 300 million operations worldwide, you, you uh, can appreciate that uh, we do have uh, plenty of uh, inhaled agents available. Uh, and uh, of course, these agents are fairly cheap because they are old and off patent. Um, and in studies that looked at sedation of patients in the intensive care units with inhaled anesthetics, uh, the cost of sedating patients, uh, at least the drug costs alone, are on the order of two to five dollars per day, compared to uh, thirty to thirty-five dollars per day if you're using propofol. Now, the thirty to thirty-five dollar a day uh, figure is conservative; it's based on our uh, pricing here at LHSC. Uh, and you can imagine that that cost will be inflated if we start to add additional uh, sedative agents. The third reason is that uh, inhaled anesthetics have comparable cardiovascular stability characteristics uh, when we compare them to things like propofol. And uh, in studies um, that in, in, in enrolled ARDS patients without uh, COVID, uh, they showed no toxicity to uh, liver and kidney, probably because uh, we're using uh, much lower levels of these agents than we need for sedating patients in the operating room. Uh, a great benefit to inhaled anesthetics is that they do have bronchodilating properties, uh, which of course improves your ventilation. Uh, in ARDS patients and helps with uh, secretion management. They have anti-inflammatory properties um, and you can appreciate that in ARD ARDS, uh, one of the major mechanisms for lung injury is disruption of the uh, blood lung barrier and the leakage of all of these inflammatory cells and cytokines into the uh, alveoli. So if we can reduce infl inflammation in the lungs themselves, we uh, will form less pulmonary edema, uh, and this leads to better oxygenation uh, in uh, prior studies. I promise not to use uh, a lot of data, but because I am a clinician scientist, I cannot resist but uh, pull up a few slides from previous uh, work. And so this was a, a study, a randomized border study comparing sevoflurane to propofol, and you've all appreciated the inflammatory marker called IL-6 has been in the news for COVID-19. And you can see that within uh, a few hours of using uh, sevoflurane, you are having, you, sh you show much lower increase in, in IL-6 compared to propofol, which suggests that uh, this uh, drug uh, reduces inflammation in the lungs. Uh, this is another study from an experimental model of ARDS, and what you can see here are three panels. Uh, on the left-hand side, the leftmost panel shows uh, a control condition, and you can see nice outlining and preserve, preservation of the integrity of alveolar um, junctions here. When we induce ARDS uh, in, in this uh, lung, you can see that these barriers get disrupted. But if we add isoflurane, which is an inhaled anesthetic, that preserves the integrity and the structure of, microstructure of, of the lung parenchyma. Inhaled agents have been reported to be toxic to RNA viruses such as measles, and since SARS-2-CoV, which is a virus responsible for COVID-19, is an RNA virus, it is possible that uh, inhaled anesthetics are also toxic, directly toxic to SARS-2-CoV, so they will kill the virus in the lungs. There is currently some work going on in Massachusetts General Hospital in, in Boston, 
to uh, study this. And uh, as you'll see, they are one of the sites uh, who are participating in our trial. So we should have some data fairly soon on this uh, particular aspect of uh, inhaled anesthetics. The key um, difference about inhaled anesthetics is that they're eliminated from the lung. You essentially exhale the gas, and that's how you get it rid out of uh, get, get it uh, um, eliminated from from your system. This is in uh, contrast to intravenous agents that require hepatic and um, uh, renal clearance. And as we know, a lot of our RDS patients develop uh, hepatic uh, and renal dysfunction. So um, as a result of this difference, studies in um, patients who are sedated with inhaled anesthetics show much faster awakening from um, the inhaled anesthetics as opposed to intravenous agents, which hopefully leads to, to faster extubation times. Uh, the uh, other interesting um, thing to note is that inhaled anesthetic, as anesthetics are all the, the only sedatives that we can directly measure using um, uh, analysis of the exhaled gas. Uh, when we give propofol to patients, we are just assigning a dose and then we're titrating to clinical effect. With inhaled anesthetics, we can still titrate to clinical effect, but we actually have the luxury of measuring the concentration of those agents in the patient's body and um, corresponding in their brain as well. In previous studies, uh, the use of inhaled anesthetics uh, shortened the duration of mechanical ventilation and resulted in faster liberation from mechanical ventilation. Of course, in the context of the pandemic, this is a huge benefit because uh, if we can get patients uh, off the ventilators quicker, we preserve ventilator and ICU capacity uh, that is obviously scarce uh, during the uh, pandemic to be available uh, for uh, our other patients. Here is some data from a randomized control trial comparing sevoflurane to midazolam. Now, this was a small trial with 25 patients in each group, uh, so it's a bit underpowered to look at clinical outcomes. But you can see even in this small uh, study, the duration of ventilation in the sevoflurane day in the sevoflurane group was about five days shorter uh, than in the midazolam group. Uh, and that sort of uh, translated to 13 ventilator-free days compared to five ventilator-free days in the Dazzlem uh, trial. So this is not a trivial uh, benefit. Um, if you can get people on average five days um, off the ventilator five days faster than with usual IV sedation, uh, this could have huge implication on your ICU and ventilator capacity, especially in the times of the pandemic. In that study, they also looked at mortality and there was a trend towards improved mortality with inhaled anesthetics. But again, the, the study was underpowered to look at mortality benefit. But we can all agree that this is an important patient-centered outcome. And the last reason I think is uh, there is data to suggest that it leads to improved uh, brain and cognitive outcomes. So in studies assessing delirium, we saw less delirium with the use of inhaled anesthetics, uh, less use of antipsychotic agents, and uh, lower incidence of hallucination and bad memories in survivors of uh, ICU uh, once they are extubated. I think the best testament to this is a experience of our recent uh, COVID-19 survivor here, at LHSC. And I will read this because this is really important. Um, she said to me that, uh, as a patient, I have experienced both intravenous and volatile anesthetic sedation. Years ago, I had a general anesthetic and most recently was in the ICU and was under intravenous sedation as a COVID patient. These experiences were vastly different from each other. Under general anesthetic, I had no dreams or sense of time passing at all. One minute I was in the operating room and the next I was in recovery suite. Under the intravenous drugs, I had many disturbing hallucinations that felt vivid and virtually indistinguishable from real life. These included dying and being at my own funeral, being reborn as a baby boy who couldn't learn his mother's language, 
And while I was in the prone position, I felt like the medical staff were trying to kill me. We can all agree that these are not trivial uh, complications of our current sedation practices. And if we can avoid uh, these kinds of uh, post ICU complications, I think they'll be very important for our IC survivors. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, a little bit more about the actual trial. So our research question um, focuses on the following population. Mechanically ventilated adult patients with proven or suspected COVID-19 disease. The intervention will be uh, inhaled volatile anesthetic based sedation and our control arm will have uh, our usual intravenous sedation. And we will be looking at two types of outcomes. So patient-centered outcomes, such as survival and quality of life, uh, as well as health system outcomes, including things like ICU-free days and ventilator-free days. In terms of study design, on the left-hand side, you can see the inclusion and exclusion criteria. I already went through the inclusion, uh, over the inclusion criteria. We'll be enrolling adult patients uh, who have been ventilated for less than 48 hours and are either confirmed or suspected for having COVID-19. We'll exclude patients who have contraindication to sedatives such as uh, propofol infusion syndrome or malignant hypothermia, high ICP, previous pneumonectomy, extremely low tidal volumes, so less than 200 mils, uh, the use of uh, drugs like prostacycline and uh, pregnancy. On the right-hand side, you can see the, the diagram for this study. And so um, if we have a ventilated uh, patient with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 disease, and if this patient meets eligibility criteria and, are, and we're able to randomize them, they will be assigned to either intervention, which is inhaled anesthetics, or control, which is IV sedatives. Now, it may occur during the pandemic that we don't have uh, enough um, IV sedatives or we may not have enough equipment to deliver inhaled anesthetics. And so the patient will not be able to, uh, we're not gonna be able to randomize the patient. So in that case, we will um, include them in the parallel cohort study that will record all the same variables, uh, but in non-randomized uh, groups, essentially. And this is, uh, just gives us uh, more power for uh, looking at outcomes uh, down, down the road. We've uh, partnered with uh, Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center, and so we are the two leading centers uh, uh, in this trial. And so far, through the help of the Canadian Critical Care Trials Group, we were able to uh, uh, a partner up with additional sites across the country. We have two hospitals in Quebec, uh, Suchum and the University of Sherbrooke. And uh, in Toronto, we have Toronto General and Toronto Western Hospitals. We have University of Alberta Hospitals participating and Massachusetts General Hospital. We're also currently um, uh, recruiting additional sites, uh, both through trials group and uh, our personal contacts. So we expect that the number of sites here will increase now that we have uh, funding for the study. The uh, outcomes that we'll be looking at, uh, as I mentioned previously, include patient-centered outcomes, so survival and quality of life. We will also be doing a cognitive outcomes sub-study as part of our work uh, in collaboration with Adrian Owen and the Brain Mind Institute here in London. And from the health system outcomes perspective, we'll look at duration of mechanical ventilation as well as ICU length of stay. And uh, of course, we will do uh, something called a cost utility analysis. And essentially what that entails is comparing the healthcare system costs of using either intravenous sedation versus inhaled anesthetics. Are we actually saving money? And you can uh, imagine that uh, while inhaled anesthetics um, uh, involve uh, the use of additional equipment, such as vaporizers to deliver these uh, medications, uh, the savings would uh, come primarily from shortening duration of ventilation and ICU length of stay. If we can shorten it by four or five days, uh, that's a lot of savings per patient. We have uh, generous support for this uh, trial, both from uh, LHSC Foundation and Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center, who uh, provided us with some seed funding to support equipment purchases. 
And uh, we're pleased to announce that we have received uh, support from the CHR and uh, the government of Ontario for this Maltesanto trial. So at this point, I will uh, stop sharing my screen and I will pass uh, uh, the puck to Ahmed, who will uh, tell you a little bit more about how we're going to deliver the anesthetics in the ICU. Perfect. Thanks, Murat. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yep, you're good. Okay. Let me share my screen here. All right, so um, essentially with, thanks, thanks for the introduction, Murad. I think it's a, a great introduction there. So essentially with a SAVE ICU, there are also uh, goals that are extend beyond the actual clin clin clinical trial itself. So what we're looking to achieve is hopefully after, uh, or even during this study, uh, to actually in, introduce a bit of a change in practice when it comes to sedation in the ICU. So we're hopefully looking at this not just becoming a study that'll finish, but also adding inhalational anesthetics to our armamentarium as intensivists. Have inhalational anesthetic be something that's available to us, like, like dexmedetomidine, like propofol, something that we would consider in our routine practice uh, for uh, sedation purposes. So how will we deliver inhalational anesthetics or inhalational sedatives in the ICU? So there's three options that we can consider here. The first we're all familiar with, and that is using the anesthesia delivery unit brought over from the operating room. We've all seen that being used. We've used it sometimes for status epilepticus patients, uh, less commonly sometimes for uh, status asthmaticus patients. They're bulky machines, they're big, they're big. they need uh, to be brought over from the OR, so they're subject to availability from the OR. And if you're not comfortable using them, they can be somewhat intimidating and you'll need expertise to help you uh, run these machines. Um, in addition, their ventilators are not as powerful as our ICU ventilators. So when you look at how we ventilate ARDS patients with very high peeps and, and uh, lung protective strategies, you can do that on, uh, on anesthesia ventilators, but you'll need significant adjustments to its settings and they're actually not uh, typically uh, as powerful as our ICU ventilators. The second option uh, would be to use a mobile anesthetic delivery module, or what they call a MADAM. And these MADAMs are actually uh, portable inline vaporizers that have been largely used by the military for sort of on the field type of anesthesia. Um, they're somewhat expensive to use. Uh, they actually have the capability of monitoring end tidal agent uh, in addition to delivering through the vaporizer. So they're, they're good in terms of what they can offer. Uh, they can offer quite a bit, except that there's an upfront cost associated with these madams. And so uh, what we'll largely trying, what, what, what we'll largely use in our study and hopefully we'll have a, a big stock of for clinical use is uh, what we call the anacondas. So anaconda stands for anesthetic conserving device. And these are basically portable inline vaporizers that will hook up in line between the ET tube and the breathing circuit. I'll talk a little bit more about the anaconda because that's really where we'll focus most of our efforts. That's really what we're trying to uh, get off the ground with in terms of delivering anesthetics in the ICU. So uh, the anaconda or the anesthetic conserving device is basically a disposable inline vaporizer. That's what it looks like. It's a, it's got the anaconda chamber itself that has um, an inside carbon filler that acts as a vaporizer. It hooks up from one side to the ventilator circuit and then from the other side, it hooks up to the endotracheal tube. And so uh, that's essentially what it looks like. You'll also hook it up uh, to the volatile infusion line. So here you hook up a syringe pump that has the volatile agent that runs it through to the vaporizer. And in, within the vaporizer, obviously, there's, um, there's a, you know, a material that actually vaporizes and conserves the anesthetic agent. 
And then uh, at the very at the end of the anaconda, you have a gas sampling line for monitoring how much agent you're delivering. What is your end title uh, agent, and uh, actually an expression of that as a MAC value as well as a minimum alveolar concentration. So that is simply what it looks like. There's two models for this anaconda. There's the big uh, model, which is 150 cc's in terms of its uh, dead space or uh, the amount of volume that is carried within the actual anaconda chamber itself. And there's a smaller 50 cc model, which has less dead space. So uh, the anaconda of recycling happening there as well. What happens with the delivery of the anesthetic itself? Well, with the anesthetic, you actually draw up uh, using a dedicated uh, you know, connection. You draw up volatile agents into a specific syringe and mount that syringe into our syringe pump. So that syringe basically will have isoflurane or sevoflurane, which are the two agents that we're planning on using. And it's a specific color-coded syringe uh, that is non-interactive with the actual volatile that is contained within it. And its lure lock, for safety purposes, is not compatible with standard IV sets. So there's no chances of error here of connecting this syringe to an IV. It's, it's very specific. It can only be connected to the actual anaconda itself. So it's got a very specific lure lock uh, for safety purposes. And at the end, that's what it will look like. It'll look like an anaconda uh, chamber hooked up uh, between the ET tube and the breathing circuit, a syringe pump hooked up, delivering volatile agent to the anaconda itself. We will be making purchases for additional equipment in order to run these inhalational anesthetics in the ICU. And these include end tidal agent monitors, so we will be monitoring how much we're delivering and what MAC value we're delivering. Uh, we will also be purchasing scavenging equipment. And there's different options to scavenge uh, inhalational anesthetics. And what we've decided to go with uh, for now is the fluorabsorb, which are canisters that are hooked up to the exhaust of the Hamilton G5 ventilators and absorb whatever inhalational agent uh, it comes out of the exhaust. And it basically, that's one of the options. There's other options, including the Delta Zorb. There's also central scavenging setups that are uh, used in the operating room. But in terms of uh, what we're going to start up with is the floor absorb, uh, which basically is provided by the same vendor as the uh, Anaconda itself. And, uh, and so these are the additional equipment that we will be setting up when we have patients on inhalational sedation in the ICU. Where do we want this to be used? Outside of clinical, the clinical trial, uh, we generally would consider using volatile sedation, inhalational anesthesia, in patients with severe refractory asthma, status asthmaticus, uh, patients who are refractory to the standard lines of treatment would likely benefit from the bronchodilation offered by inhalational agents. We have used it in the past for status epilepticus, and we uh, would encourage to st encourage you to still consider using it in refractory status epilepticus now that it will become more available uh, to us for clinical use. Uh, another use for it potentially would be difficult sedation situations. And what I mean here is we've all seen these patients who are opioid dependent or, uh, you know, are requiring very large doses of narcotics or in sedation to stay in bed and nothing's really working and the nurses are saying we're on this much you know anesthet this much uh, sedative and they're still wide awake i think for these patients volatile sedation may be the ideal agent if you're really getting nowhere with your standard sedative drugs uh, patients who are tolerant to anesthetics like patients who get recurrent burn dressing changes would also be a candidate for volatile sedation if they start developing tolerance and increasing requirements for uh, anesthetics for their recurrent procedures. When you use it, uh, you could also use it for routine sedation. I think down the road, that's the hope, is that we have it as part of our armamentarium. It's something you would consider. What do you want to sedate this patient with? Is it propofol or is it uh, inhalation agent? And when you use it for routine sedation, usually 0.3 MAC is often sufficient, and that's the minimum alveolar concentration uh, and that's basically a standardized way uh, 
of dosing these inhalational agents. We spoke about sevoflurane and isoflurane being the two agents that we'll be using. Uh, the C in terms of equipotent doses, 2% sevoflurane is equivalent, is equivalent to 1.2% isoflurane. And in order to just simplify things, both of, you know, 2% uh, and 1.2% of iso, they're both expressed as one MAC. MAC is basically um, the effect of the dose on the patient, and it's the standard, standardized way of reporting what you're giving the patient in terms of inhalational agent. One MAC for any agent is equivalent to, you know, one MAC, essentially. So it's a, basically a way of clarifying how much you're giving. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about routine sedation because uh, this is not something that we uh, use, but it's something that's actually been studied in literature and has been shown to have benefits. Uh, I'm showing here a meta-analysis of eight prospective trials, including 523 patients. These were mainly CV ICU patients and post-op surgical patients. So uh, they were not ARDS patients per se. But what they showed in this meta-analysis was that there was a reduction in time to extubation. Uh, and you can see here, they were talking in minutes. It was shorter term, shorter term sedation. So there was a mean difference of 292 minutes uh, uh, compared with midazolam in terms of shorter uh, time to extubation with inhalational agents. It was also uh, even shorter than propofol. So there was a mean difference of 29 minutes less uh, than propofol for time to extubation. So there was uh, throughout a significant difference in time uh, to extubate. There was no difference in this meta-analysis in adverse events, hospital length of stay, and mortality. Um, but we will be looking at, I mean, these are really surgical patients with uh, sort of more of an expected lower mortality rate. In our study, we'll be looking at ARDS patients to explore the trend in decreased mortality that was observed in that one ARDS study. What are the advantages of using inhalational sedation in the ICU? As Murat was saying, there are very rapid onset, rapid offset. They basically um, are uh, administered by inhalation and they're eliminated by exhalation. So they're very rapidly cleared. They're very predictable in their pharmacokinetics. Uh, unlike sedative agents where IV agents like propofol or uh, opioids, where sometimes you're dealing with a few days of having to get you know, the patient to get the sedative agent out of their system. We've all seen that where a patient has sedation shut off for days and they're still not waking up and just, we're just waiting for them to clear. When you look at inhalational agents, their kinetics are, are much cleaner. They're, the patients tend to recover quicker and that is likely the reason we see differences in extubation, time to extubation, at least in the surgical population and uh, and likely in the ARDS population as well. So uh, the metabolites are inactive. Uh, some, uh, very little of the isoflurane gets metabolized, about 0.2% in the liver. Uh, about 5% of sevoflurane gets metabolized. Inactive metabolites, the primary route of elimination is through exhalation though. Uh, as we were also saying, as Marat was mentioning, there's advantages to end tidal monitoring. And, to monitoring uh, how we deliver these inhalational agents. We can actually now monitor how much we're giving. And so the end tidal gas monitor approximates the brain concentrations of inhalational agents, which is a real luxury in terms of titrating how much you need to give. So they're predictable, they're easily titratable, and uh, we're hoping cost-effective as well. What uh, are the pharmacodynamics, though, of inhalational agents? I'll give a brief uh, introduction of what to expect when you're running these inhalational agents. So in terms of their effect on the respiratory system, isoflurane tends to be a bit of an upper airway irritant, uh, and so it's somewhat pungent, and therefore it can irritate the upper airways. The nice thing is we will be bypassing completely the upper airways by delivering through an endotracheal tube. So essentially this sort of pungent upper airway irritant effect you see if patients are spontaneously uh, breathing through a face mask, isoflurane, but it's not really something you witness too much when you're actually bypassing the upper airway through an endotracheal tube. Uh, when it comes to the lower airway, all inhalational agents are potent bronchodilators, whether it be sevoflurane or isoflurane, 
they all have consistent effects uh, in terms of bronchodilatation of the lower airway. I must say though, when you're close enough to getting extubated, um, sevoflurane tends to be a little bit of a better option because of the lack of upper airway irritant effect. Like if you're gonna extubate a patient and they're gonna breathing, be breathing out some of the inhalational agent, sevoflurane is probably a better option for asthma patients as it will be less of an irritant, at least to the upper airway. The other effects that uh, you would expect to see while running inhalational agents include a bit of a depressed myocardial contractility, a bit of a drop in systemic vascular resistance. These effects are very similar to what you see with IV sedative agents, specifically propofol. So with propofol, you do expect a drop in blood pressure. You do expect a little bit of a drop in myocardial contractility, a drop in systemic vascular resistance. In lower doses though, uh, if you're talking uh, lower doses of propofol versus lower doses of inhalational agents, propofol tends to be uh, more profound in terms of its effects on hemodynamics uh, compared to inhalational agents. So in lower doses, inhalational agents are preferred in terms of their hemodynamic profile, especially sevoflurane, uh, which tends to be very, uh, or is quite hemodynamically stable in comparison to the other agents. Uh, isoflurane in lower doses is also relatively stable. In higher doses, you can see the drop in systemic vascular resistance, which is what you would see with higher dose of any IV sedative agent as well. So in terms of the central nervous system effects, uh, in lower doses, you get sedation. In higher doses, you get complete anesthesia. And it's very predictable. The central nervous system effects are very predictable. Uh, you get EEG burst suppression uh, with higher doses as well. And you get a reduction in cerebral metabolic rate. As a result of vasodilatation of the uh, cerebral uh, blood vessels, you get an increase in ICP as a result of giving inhalational agents. And so this brings us to the next point here. What are the contraindications to inhalational agents? So at the bedside, uh, things that you would want to rule out before you consider giving an inhalational agent would be a patient who is small and taking small tidal volumes. So if the tidal volumes are less than 200 mils, then they will likely be rebreathing with the anaconda. Uh, the anaconda, as we said, has a chamber itself that there's two sizes, 50 mils and 150 mils. But essentially, if your tidal volumes are approaching less than 200 mils, then there will be significant rebreathing uh, with that dead space. So really, that's something you'd want to check. Uh, with inhalational agents as well, they tend to be incompatible with Flolan inhaled prostacycline. So that would be a contraindication. If you have a patient with one lung, getting one lung vent ventilation or a patient who's had a pneumonectomy, uh, that's a, also a relative contraindication. And the reason for that is inhalational agents do have a little bit of an effect in terms of obtunding the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction that happens. So if you're ventilating one lung and the other lung is uh, not, being, or not being ventilated or or you have a pneumonectomy, you can get an obtunded, obtunded effect of the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, a bit of shunting with inhalational agents. So that would be something you would uh, basically not want to run inhalational agents for. The other uh, contraindications include increased ICP. As we mentioned, there is a bit of a relative increase in ICP with inhalational agents, and propofol tends to have a favorable effect uh, in terms of ICP compared to inhalational agents. And the last contraindication would be if the patient has a, uh, has a personal history of malignant hyperthermia or a family history of malignant hyperthermia. You'd want to certainly avoid volatile uh, anesthetic. It, with regards to safety, and I know uh, this may be something that a lot of people will want to know about. How safe is it to run inhalational agents in the ICU? The National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health uh, NIOSH, which un operates under the CDC, uh, recommends certain exposure limits, and they're very similar between the U.S. and Canada. So they quote the long-term exposure limit, which is a time-weighted average of exposure over eight hours, uh, to be about two parts per million for isoflurane and sevoflurane. And these are the numbers that we have here in uh, Canada. So uh, what do we get exposed to if we do run inhalational agents in the ICU? And this was a study that was done in Sunnybrook uh, 
where they looked at uh, inhalational agents in the ICU and what are the exposures that staff are getting from these inhalational agents um, that are being run in the environment that we would be running it in essentially. And what they found was that the average atmospheric concentration with adequate scavenging employed was about 0.4 parts per million plus or minus 0.5. So really quite low, uh, certainly lower than the uh, maximum recommended exposure limit. And so that is, that is it's quite low actually. And so it's, it's quite safe to run uh, in, terms of its, uh, in terms of occupational exposure uh, if you have adequate scavenging, which is certainly something that uh, we will be employing. So what about healthcare staff who are pregnant? And that is something I think people want to know about as well. So there have been earlier studies in the 70s uh, that have described nurses uh, giving nitrous oxide in dental offices without ad adequate scavenging, uh, having higher rates of uh, miscarriages and spontaneous abortions. And these studies were back in the 70s um, where they didn't have actual scavenging. And so, well, the current uh, studies, uh, there's at least a couple of studies that have come out uh, more recently where there's adequate scavenging and exposure limits that are abided with that are within the National Institute uh, limits. Uh, the risk of miscarriage is actually reduced if not eliminated uh, with effective scavenging in place. And that is directly from the CDC website. And if you look at the evidence, that is absolutely correct. When you look at the studies where scavenging was employed, the risk was no different from control. The risk of miscarriage and spontaneous abortion was not increased if there was adequate scavenging in place. Uh, the, other, uh, uh, the other aspect that people may want to hear about is what about if we have healthcare staff uh, like nurses, RTs, or physicians who are MH susceptible themselves? What should we do? Um, my recommendation would be if we have healthcare staff who are MH susceptible, I would recommend that it's probably best that they stay out of the bay where the inhalational agent is being delivered. Even though the exposure is minimal, I would suggest that stay out of that bay is probably the advice that I would give. But just also to quantify the risk, I, I would like to put some numbers onto what triggers MH and uh, compare that to the exposures that we see so typical concentrations that actually trigger malignant hyperthermia under anesthetic uh, in the operating room are typically concentrations upwards of 10,000 parts per million. We're typically running 1%, 2% inhalational agent in the operating room. And these are typically the concentrations that will trigger an actual MH reaction in the OR. Well, what about if they do muscle biopsies? When they do muscle biopsies, they actually try to test them by exposing them to volatile agent, uh, specifically halothane. And so uh, for people who are suspected to have MH susceptibility, these muscle biopsies are basically taken usually out of the quadriceps and soaked in halothane and caffeine. And they call it the halothane caffeine contractor test or the HCCT. And the concentration of halothane that they use to trigger uh, an MH type reaction would be in the range of 30,000 parts per million or 3% halothane to trigger the reaction. And so you can compare these numbers with the actual ambient concentrations that people can get exposed to, whether it be in the OR, whether it be in PACU, uh, or the numbers that I have up here for the ICU, which are all very similar. Um, basically 0.4 parts per million is what, you, what you'd expect in terms of exposure if you have adequate scavenging in place. And so just in terms of comparison and quantifying the risk, the risk doesn't seem to be that high, um, but still I would say my best advice would be if you're MH susceptible, uh, it's, not, it's not worth taking, uh, you know, I would say just stay out of that bay if possible. All right, so uh, this is my final slide here and I just want to say that there's a huge team working on this and we're meeting every Saturday to move this project forward. And uh, Murat had gone through the entire team. Everybody's working uh, hard to get this off the ground. Save ICU is not just going to be a research project. Uh, we're also looking at inventory and equipment, uh, making it available for clinical use. We're looking at currently a uh, standardized operating procedure, an SOP document 
which is it's in, in its final stages at this point uh, for implementation that will include responsibilities of both RTs and RNs. We're looking at establishing an online order set. We're looking at educational modules, which, uh, which will be online for our nurses. And I, you know, there's a team that started working on that. And so there's a whole team working on bringing about this practice change. And so um, basically uh, I, with that, I'll conclude and I'll say uh, thank you to that whole team and I'll open it up to questions.